My name is Margaret Horvath and I will be your technical assistant today. This session will be recorded and will be available on the TDSB website at www.tdsb.on.ca. To ensure a smooth session for all attendees, we have enabled both Q&A and the chat function, muted all participants and prevented screen sharing. If you want to open the Q&A and the chat function, simply, simply click on that, that icon. We request that both spaces be used in a way that creates a safe and a respectful environment for all to engage. If you are calling into the session, please use star nine, the raise hand function, and the moderator will try to get to your question. Next step is audio and microphone. The audio quality of this session is based on your individual bandwidth. If you're worried about slow internet connection, you can call in by using the dial-in information included in the invite. The invite is also located at tdsb.on.ca under the heading latest news. If for some reason your speaker's bandwidth becomes unstable and things become choppy, please bear with us. We'll hear it too and we will work as quickly as possible to resolve the issue. You may exit or change the full screen speaker or gallery view by clicking the top right button or view options drop down menu. Lastly, there'll be a quick survey for you to complete before you leave. I've already put it into the chat for you to have a look at. Now to get things started, I'm going to hand it over to Aretha Phillips, your Ward 13 rep for the Parent Involvement Advisory Committee, more commonly known as PIAC. Over to you, Aretha. You have to unmute yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Aretha Phillip, as Margaret would have introduced me. Before we get started on the meeting, I just wanted to do our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis and Inuit people. I would like to say that I'm really happy to be here tonight uh, to uh, introduce the evening's um, conversation on behalf of the Parent Inv Involvement Advisory Committee, also known as PIAC. Uh, we are a parent body of the TDSB that supports, encourages, and enhances parent engagement at the Board of Trustees level. We are, we are working in order to improve student achievement and well-being. And we are very pleased to collaborate tonight with the board in the delivery of these important conversations for parents. Please enjoy tonight's conversation. I'm now going to turn things over to Trustee Rachel Chernos Lynn of Ward 11. Good evening. Um, so, my name is Rachel Chernos Lynn, and I'm the trustee for Ward 11, and also have the privilege of serving as the trustee representative for the Parent Involvement Advisory Committee here at the TDSB and getting to work with Aretha Phillip regularly. Uh, so, tonight I'm pleased to introduce the second of three webinars that, we'll, that we will be hosting this week. All of the topics for these webinars have been chosen based on direct feedback from parents and guardians at the TDSB. And tonight's topic, mental health, well-being, and routines for adolescents and teens, is certainly one that many parents have been talking about, myself included, quite frankly, with two high school-aged daughters and another preteen as well in the household. Over the last couple of months, the COVID-19 pandemic and physical distancing has dramatically. So many parents have raised concerns about the impacts of all of these changes on their children's mental health and well-being. With regular routines no longer set by the morning school bell, parents have been challenged with figuring out how to establish routines and how to set their children up for success in this new environment. As a school board, it's crucial that we listen to our school communities. It helps us make informed decisions, and it also helps, to provide, helps us to provide support and guidance where needed. And so tonight we look forward to an engaging evening where we hope to address parent concerns related to mental health, well-being, and routines. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce this evening's moderator, Salim Hanif. Salim is a mental health lead at the TDSB with a mandate to support and enhance the mental health and well-being of all students. One of the areas of focus in his work happens to be the intersection of equity, youth engagement, and technology in relation to student well-being. 
With COVID-19, remote learning and physical distancing now a part of our new reality, Salim's work makes him extremely well suited to lead us in a discussion on mental health, well-being, and routines in adolescents and teens in our present circumstances. Over to you, Salim. Great, thank you, Trustee Chernel Salim, for that very kind introduction. Uh, welcome again, everyone. Uh, my name is Salim Hanif, uh, and uh, the Mental Health and Wellbeing Lead for Learning Centers Two and Three, which is basically Scarborough and North of the 401. Um, so, thank you for having me here to move the uh, discussion forward this evening. So. Uh, we have three esteemed panelists that will be speaking about various aspects of adolescent mental health and well-being tonight. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, feel free to type any questions you may have into the chat box, uh, and then we'll kind of group them uh, together if there's any emerging themes, and uh, we'll pose them to our panelists at the end of the three uh, talks, uh, and we'll get their input on the questions that you pose. So let's get right into it. First, starting with uh, Dr. Amy Chung. So Dr. Amy Chung is an associate scientist in the Hurwitz Brain Sciences Program at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center and an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. She works clinically as a psychiatrist with young people with mood and anxiety disorders and their families. In 2014, Dr. Chung was awarded the $1 million Bell Canada Chair in Adolescent Mood and Anxiety Disorders. Dr. Chung has also been a long-standing supporter of the TDSB in many regards along with her support of the Ontario College of Teachers Advisory on Mental Health and Wellbeing, which basically outlines teachers' roles and responsibilities in supporting student mental health and well-being. Dr. Chung will be speaking today a little bit about mental health and well-being in adolescents through difficult times such as the pandemic and um, what to look out for, what some of the things we can do and so forth. So Dr. Amy, over to you. Thank you so much, Salim, for the introduction. Um, so as Salim mentioned, I work clinically with young people and their families. It's, uh, I often get asked if it's difficult, but I actually really enjoy the work. I find teenagers really fun to work with. So I hope that comes out in my talk tonight. Um, I'll just ask the slide to be moved forward, I guess, because I don't think I have control. So um, just speaking about mental illness, um, for all of you, I'm sure that you're aware by now that mental illness is serious debilitating health conditions. I think. Um, for a long time, we didn't take mental health concerns in young people as seriously as we should have. We know now that they're not just little adults, but they actually do have um, a lot of difficulties that can start very early on. And um, especially as they hit the difficult years of um, adolescence, um, as the hormones are raging and there are lots of new things to learn and independence, they become more and more difficult to deal with. And that tends to be the time when mental illness will become more um, present. Um, and uh, start. Um, we know that the most common mental illness, depression, is now the leading cause of disability worldwide. And I get asked this question all the time, how is this possible, um, Dr. Chung, that we have heart disease, we have diabetes, we have asthma, we have cancer, we have COVID, and yet depression is the leading dis cause of disability worldwide? Well, it's because as a society, we really have not dealt with prevention, so we don't help our young people when they start to de develop difficulties with their emotional health. We've not invested a lot of money into looking into treatments for illnesses like depression. And we have a lot of stigma and shame around uh, mental illness. And so there's really a lot of people out there who are not being treated, and most commonly actually are young people. Um, we know that our teenagers are healthy, they're supposed to lead long, um, successful lives, but they do um, pass away during their adolescence. And we know that the most common cause is accidents, because we know that teenagers can be impulsive. But the second leading cause of death among our young people is actually suicide. And almost 100% of them who die by suicide will have a diagnosable mental illness. And most of them have had contact with healthcare providers before they die, and yet they were not um, treated successfully. And so we know that Mental illness is debilitating, um, and it can also, um, in some instances, lead to death. And so it is a very serious health condition that we need to pay more attention to. I'm so glad that we're here tonight to talk about it. Um, next slide. So we know that one in five students in a high school class will struggle with significant mental health issues. It's just 20% of the kids. And so when I see my patients in my office, I tell them, you know, you just have to look around your classroom. There are actually people in your classroom who are struggling. You may not know who they are, but they're there. And unfortunately, less than half of them are able to access the care that they need. 
And it seems astonishing to me that we have um, actually my colleagues, so my you know family doctors, pediatricians, who are actually not well trained. They're not trained well enough to actually recognize mental illness in our teenagers. And so that's one of the biggest barriers. We also know that even after um, the mental health condition is recognized, they, these doctors and healthcare providers have trouble referring on to a healthcare system that can be quite confusing to navigate and quite fragmented. And so these kids, after struggling for a long time being unwell, um, finally their parents, um, you know, as a parent myself, I often, you know, try to help my kids get over things. Maybe I'll just pass. You know, parents start to recognize it, then they take them to a doctor who takes time to, to recognize it. And then they're kind of in, thrown into a system that's difficult to navigate. And then on top of that, still the stigma around even wanting help. So a lot of teenagers, even by the time they get to the help that they need, they're still really worried about people finding out they have struggles. And so there's just so many barriers um, for our teenagers to actually get the help that they need, and especially for their families to be able to help them. And I'll talk a lot about some of the innovations that we have going on right now in the province that will be very helpful to you as you navigate the system if you're struggling with your teenager with mental health problems. Um, next slide. So what are some of the common mental health concerns in young people? So I've got a bit of a list here for you that I'll go through uh, with you. Some of them are very common, some of them are less common. So you heard from Salim's introduction that I work mainly with teenagers with depression and anxiety. So mood disorder, including depression and bipolar disorder is the most common mental health concern that you're going to see in your teenagers. It mainly hits girls, and we know that it has something to do with their hormonal changes in adolescence. It also has to do with their plummeting self-esteem as they hit high school years. Um, and so depression is very common. And also girls have, um, are more talkative, so they're more likely to present with depression in, uh, in their um, doctor's offices and with their counselors. Um, they are also um, more likely to even just go to the doctor's office because it may go for um, other health um, issues like their period or menstrual cycle. Um, depression is very debilitating and I'll go through the symptoms of depression a little bit later on. Um, it can include things like being tired, not being able to pay attention, having lots of um, uh, aches and pains, headaches. We know that in younger kids it presents commonly as headaches and stomach aches. And depression uh, is most likely to connect to, um, to be connected to suicide also. So it's something that we become very, very concerned about. Anxiety disorders. Um, so unlike depression, which tends to present in adolescence, anxiety disorder um, starts really young. So if you notice that your young person is anxious, they probably were a little bit anxious earlier on and maybe you didn't notice it, or maybe you did notice and it was kind of irritating because your child wouldn't go for a sleepover camp or your child wouldn't eat foods that were touching each other or your child always needed one stuffy when they went to bed or wouldn't go on a play date. And the anxiety really does kind of grow over time. And as they hit adolescence, it becomes very different. So for example, not being able to present a, a project in front of a group of people, being socially anxious, so not being able to hang out with other people. And you might say, you know, we've all been really anxious with COVID. It's been three months of anxiety, so it must be really bad right now. And surprisingly, um, the kids who have anxiety right now are actually doing not so bad. Um, they are um, actually um, finding this isolation um, somewhat soothing. And uh, some of them have told me that it makes them um, feel very validated that they have always like to be alone and now they're being mandated to be alone and everyone else is alone. And in some teenagers have also told me, you know, the FOMO that they had, the fear of missing out, hasn't been happening either. So they don't feel like they're really missing out on anything because no one is really doing anything. Um, but we know that as COVID goes on, then anxiety will start to grow. You know, once it starts to, it's initially, I think we all kind of found it a, a little bit calming, but now anxiety is starting to get higher and higher uh, because there's more and more difficulties um, with, um, you know, being able to get out and wearing a mask and being social distancing and getting in trouble for not social distancing, etc. So anxiety can present as a panic disorder where someone feels um, very anxious. They might feel like they're having a mental uh, breakdown, they can just be crying. 
um, and that's mainly in girls. In boys, it can present as um, someone who's just frozen and can't speak and having a really difficult time kind of engaging. In the more severe range, they can have obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, where they have just rituals and routines that they can spend hours and hours each day um, on these routines and rituals. Um, and remember that um, anxiety as a disorder um, can also look um, like inattention. So one of the things that you need to pay attention to is that depression, you can be inattentive. Anxiety, you can be inattentive. So if you think of a time when um, you were really nervous, you probably were so nervous thinking about something, you probably had trouble paying attention to what was happening in front of you. And so inattention can happen with anxiety or with depression. But you also need to pay attention to kids who have had attentional issues for a long time. So what we're thinking about is sort of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. A lot of times kids um, who've had ADHD for a long time uh, who are very bright have been able to hide it. So they never have any academic difficulties until they hit their teenage years. And uh, they actually, um, the, their inattention doesn't come up until their grades start to drop in high school. And the parents will discuss with me, well, they never had any trouble with school before. And then we'll talk about the fact that their child was actually quite bright. So one, it's a big struggle for the teenager. So to pay attention to what's going on around um, them being able to do well in school. But secondly, is that we know if kids have um, ADHD that's untreated over time, they eventually become oppositional. They have difficulties with um, teachers, with their parents, and then they start to, uh, can also start to uh, use substances to make themselves feel better. And so not treating attentional issues is also a really critical issue. Um, behavioral issues, um, we often think of that in younger kids, so someone who's not listening, who's uh, disruptive in class. As we hitch the teenage year, we think more around legal issues, so uh, boys who are struggling with legal issues, girls who are doing risky behaviors. Um, oftentimes, these behavioral issues are actually linked to an undiagnosed um, mental health problem. And so it's really important that we don't label a child as, oh, just having behavior issues, but actually advocate for a good um, clinical assessment with a doctor, a psychiatrist, or a psychologist to try to figure out whether their underlying mental health conditions that's actually causing them to have these behavioral issues. One other thing that I know we'll hear about tonight is around um, trauma. And we do see a lot of teenagers who have behavioral issues because there's either previous history of trauma or ongoing trauma, whether it's familial or bullying um, that might be going on that's leading them to uh, behave in a way that's very distressing. What we also see a lot in teenagers is uh, substance misuse or abuse. Um, we know that teenagers who have depression or anxiety or even attention noise or ADHD will start to self-medicate with substances if they're not treated properly. And so the, a child who has anxiety who can't sleep will start smoking weed to fall asleep. Um, a child who's feeling really depressed will start to use marijuana to feel happier, to hang out or drink alcohol to forget about what's going on in their, in, in their emotions. And so substance misuse is also a really significant piece to notice. And I think most parents do notice it. Um, and just to keep an eye on sort of when it is being used. So it should be used kind of if you are allowing it. Um, and uh, kind of what teenagers normally will do is using on weekends and evenings. If your teenager is actually using it during the day, it's a real red flag for you that you need to um, talk to them about it and address it. And then also discuss with them, are you using it because it's helping you with a symptom that you have that really could be treated some other way? And then the last two disorders, psychotic disorders and eating disorders is um, much more uncommon, much, uh, much less common. Psychotic illnesses like schizophrenia is 1% of the population, but um, teenagers who have bipolar disorder or depression can actually lose touch with reality and develop symptoms of psychosis. Um, so that's something to watch out for. Um, teenagers can also become psychotic or lose touch with reality when they're using substances, a lot of it, if they have addiction issues, so that's another issue. And psychotic illnesses tend to happen more often in boys versus eating disorder, which tends to happen in girls. And so I think when I say eating disorders, most people probably think about 
anorexia nervosa where someone is very skinny and doesn't eat or bulimia where someone binge eats and then purges by exercising or vomiting but we also have more subtle eating disorders like uh, orthorexia where someone a uh, girl mainly will talk about having a particular philosophy or a particular lifestyle and they'll choose to not eat certain things so they might become vegan or vegetarian and it just becomes a point where they reduce the, what they eat the, uh, to like five things a day and so it, it can kind of grow pretty quickly and so parents do need to keep an eye on that especially for your girls um, who are developing a key sign for that is if a girl starts to lose her uh, menstrual cycle, then that's when you know that uh, there's something physically wrong um, with their eating. We also know that if someone is depriving themselves of food, that they will feel depressed and anxious. And so you may actually notice a depression and anxiety first in a teenage girl who's struggling with her eating. So next slide. So now that I've talked a little bit about the most common disorders, how do you know if you notice some of these things in your teenagers that it is actually an issue? Um, well, first of all, if you notice something, um, you should be concerned if it becomes really persistent. So it lasting for weeks to months. So it's not gonna be come and go day to day. It's gonna be there for weeks to months and it'll get worse. It might still get worse and get better, but it is not gonna go away. And it's not precipitated by what's going on in their environment. It's going to be, constantly there it might be worsened by a stressor like they might be more sad because they're having a fight with a friend uh, but they're not just sad because they've had a fight with their friend you'll also note changes in their behavior and their functioning so they will start to act different so teenagers um, over the past you know decade that I've been doing research they've really started to tell us that you know I want to be able to do the things I'm supposed to do well right so my functioning I want to be able to learn well I want to be able to interact with my friends, so my peer and family relationships, my family, I should be able to get along with my family and my friends. I should be able to enjoy the fun things that people like to do, like my extracurricular activities. So I should be able to enjoy that, and that would be really helpful if I did. And they shouldn't be having difficulties with coping to the point where I'm so irritable and I'm having temper outbursts and I'm angry all the time. And so if you notice any changes in their functioning, that's when you should be really concerned along with the symptoms I mentioned before, anxiety, depression, eating, substance misuse. And that's when you really need to get your teenager to some professional attention. So next slide. Um, so remember I mentioned to you that I wanted to show you, uh, talk a little bit more about signs and symptoms of depression, because this is very, very common. Um, and uh, for some teenagers, it's actually worse in the winter months. It may be related to school, but we know that in adults, it's also related to just the lack of light and just um, and the winter temperatures. And obviously, I want to sh share with you that depression you see is an emotional issue. It's in your brain. So you see the sadness, you see the irritability, um, you see the poor stress tolerance. So they're not able to tolerate a lot of stress in their lives. They have thoughts of death and dying, hopelessness. But it's also a real physical illness, right? You see the low energy and fatigue. When teenagers talk to me about depression, they say that they just cannot drag themselves out of bed. It's like they have weights on. They're not interested at all in the things that used to interest them. They're no find it interesting. They have so much trouble concentrating. They can't sleep. They can't eat. They have aches and pains. And so this really shows you that depression is a real physical illness like anything else. And I want you to remember this. When you see a teenager who is struggling with mental problems and you don't really see any quote unquote physical signs, they're all there and they feel it, but you just may not see it. So next slide. Um, so what are some of the things that you can do that can support your child's mental health? And I think one of the key thing is to really encourage open dialogue. Um, getting your adolescent to talk about their mental health concerns, their emotional wellness, their suicidal thoughts, it's not going to reinforce their state of mind. It sounds really scary to bring up something that you don't want to talk about, but it's actually really helpful to them because it's, otherwise it's just all in their mind and they actually think you don't notice. And uh, oftentimes teenagers come into my office and they're like, you want to talk to me about that? Oh, no one, I didn't, any, didn't think anyone would ever want to talk to me about that. So talking or psychotherapy is one of the most effective treatments for mental health concerns. And in certain cases can be as effective as medications. And if you scan a teenager's brain, 
before and after successful psychotherapy training, you actually change, see changes, biochemical changes in their brain. So it is very effective to actually just have a conversation and to talk to someone. And what you're trying to encourage is for them to be open about talking about their emotions, talking about asking for help and asking for help and receiving help. And what you need to think about when you're encouraging us open dialogue is how open are you about your mental health? So are you a parent who comes home after work and says, I'm going to have a drink to relax? Or are you someone who says, well, I've had a tough day. I think I'm going to go do some self-care and maybe do some mindfulness and maybe talk to my friend or maybe go for a walk. Your teenager uh, watches what you're doing. And so you need to lead by example and be open about your mental health and your emotional health and how you deal with your mental health concerns. Because if you don't talk about it, your teenager is not going to want to talk about it. Next slide. The other really important piece for you, as I mentioned, the, the healthcare system is very fragmented and can be difficult and confusing to navigate, is that you really need to be an advocate for your child in all circumstances, whether it's in a school setting, um, in healthcare. We're all trying our best, but we all are overworked and it's difficult to support a teenager who has difficulty. And so you need to be advocate and get support for your child. And one of the things that happens a lot is that because there's stigma, there's shame, there's just lack of knowledge or information sometimes. When a child is struggling at school, um, they actually get disciplined in a very ineffective manner and they get actually more stress put on them. And that, this actually makes them worse, makes their illness worse. And I can tell you that 100% of the kids who come into my office, the biggest thing um, that they're struggling with they come in is obviously their mental illness, but it's actually what's happening at school and what's happening with their parents. And often the school is not going well and their parents are upset and that is putting a lot of stress on them. And so one of the first things that I tell my teenagers when they come in is how I can help take stress off of them. And almost 100% of time, it has to do with getting their school and their parents on board to help them. Um, school is a very important aspect of a teenager's life, obviously. It's like their job. But if we're sick, we have to take a little bit of time from work and we need some accommodations. And so it's the same thing for a student who's struggling with mental health problems. And uh, so this is a very important aspect around just being an advocate, making sure that your teenager is actually getting the support they need in the school setting. Next slide. But I think it's also really important to remember that you have to look after yourself first. I think when I went around uh, speaking with the College of Teachers, uh, the um, chair of every session talked about the fact that it's sort of like being on an airplane and there's low oxygen. You need to put the oxygen mask on yourself first because you can't help your teenager who's ill unless you can look after yourself first. You need to be well. Because mental illness affects all of us. And if you have a teenager who struggles with mental illness, there's probably um, other mental illness in your family. And so it may be in you. Uh, maybe it's recognized, maybe it's not, maybe it's treated, maybe it's not. And so you need to look after yourself. And even if you don't have any mental health concerns, it's very stressful for the care, to care for a child who's ill, whether it's asthma, diabetes, cancer, anything. And so you need to make sure that you look after yourself and make use of your local and school resources and get support for yourself. And you cannot and should not do it alone. You need, you need to support yourself. Next slide. So what can schools do to help? So I think I just saw in the chat that um, we were mentioning professional support. So in some school settings in collaboration with other um, supports, community agencies, care is provided, so actual direct care. School is a great spot though, for sure, for supporting your child to attend school. Because one of the first things that kids when they're sick is that they have trouble attending school. So maybe they need to have more supports to attend a regular school, maybe a reduced course load or a different kind of schedule. Maybe they actually need to go to an alternative school where they have a lot of support with making it to their classes, or maybe they even need to be homeschooled for a period of time. Regardless, school is a great place, uh, is, is great at supporting that piece. School can also be great with accommodations that are very helpful with a teenager with mental health concerns. Remember I mentioned that school can create a lot of stress. 
School can also reduce a lot of stress. I've also had teenagers come into my office where the vice principal has been so great that I actually don't need to do anything for them. That, that everything that can be done for them has already been done. It's amazing when I see that happening because it just means that the system is really working for this teenager. School accommodation can also help deal with symptoms. So if you're really anxious and can't present in front of class, if your teacher allows you to present via video or at lunchtime alone, that's a really great way of helping a teenager deal with their anxiety symptoms. School is also a great place because the kids is there all the time. It can also really help with crisis uh, prevention. So for example, if a student is in the school um, classroom and they're going into distress, if there's a plan set up, kind of the same way that your child with asthma has a puffer in a nurse's office, a teenager who has emotional issues can say, I need to go to guidance and that there's a there's an understanding that that means that teenager needs to go to guidance and sit and rest and have a snack so that they can kind of calm down and not be in distress. School can do a lot in alleviating what could become a crisis um, and actually help a teenager make it home safely and then be able to return to school the next day. Next slide. So what can you do as a parent to help? I think I've talked about being a good role model. Um, you know, really modeling, asking for help, self-care, looking after yourself, not being ashamed of talking about mental health problems, um, talking about what's happening in, in your family, because oftentimes kids think they're the only person in a family that struggles with depression and anxiety. Talk about what you see, because it's, you know, without an opinion or judgment, but just kind of commenting that you notice things that's going on. You know, you seem really tired. You don't, you're not eating very much. You're not really hanging out with your friends. Your teacher, your teenagers need to know that you notice what's going on, um, even though they don't like it and they talk back. Um, treat mental illness like any other medical problem, like diabetes, asthma, give them the benefit of the doubt. Even though you don't see the physical symptoms, it's a medical problem, just like what I presented to you with depression. It's very debilitating physically. Be an advocate, I've already talked about that, really important. Encourage your child to follow through with treatment. Remember we talked about the fact that, you know, a child is ill, they don't get help for a while, then they go tell their parents, their parents may be taking a bit of time trying to figure out what's going on, getting the right help, gets them to the doctor, doctor refers them, and now they are talking, they're trying to find someone to talk to about very personal issues that's been going for a really long time. And they may not like that first person that they meet, or maybe it's the wrong person um, for them. And so encouraging your child to follow through with treatment and care is really, really important. In fact, one of the first things I say to my patients when they come in is that, you know, I'm not here to treat your sore throat. We're going to talk about really serious personal things. And so if you don't like me, or if you feel like we're not good fit, you need to let me know so that I can help you find some one else to work with very quickly. And then the last thing is when I talk about finding supports for yourself, it's also really good to have other supportive adults for your child, for your teenager, other people that can talk to. Now it might be an older cousin, it might be an aunt or uncle, or a family friend, so that there's more than just you to support your child. And oftentimes teenagers tell me that they like their parents, they love them, but they don't want to stress them out, so they like to talk to other adults. And so that's a really important piece. Teachers often can play that role, but obviously they may not be available after hours, weekends. And so having other supportive adults in your child's life is really important. Next slide. So some of the really good innovations have come out recently to help you as a family to navigate the system and to get care for your teenager. The first one is Family Navigation Project out of Sunnybrook. Um, family Navigation was designed for families by families who've struggled to access care for their teenagers. It's a one-stop support for families. The navigators hop on board and help families find the resources and services that they need for their teenager. And it's available in Toronto and surrounding areas and it's to be expanded across Ontario. Um, and that's a great um, place to uh, land if you're really struggling or if your teenager isn't willing to see anyone or you feel like your, um, your teenager um, doesn't want any help and you don't know what to do or you just can't find the right resources in your community. Next slide. 
So Youth Wellness Hubs Ontario is a walking clinic that's been opened, uh, three of them in Toronto. I actually work in one of them. And it's a hub that is designed for youth by youth. So it was a one-stop shop for care. You have nursing, you have psychiatry, you have a walk-in counseling every day of the week. And more of them have been opened across Ontario. As like I said, there are three in Toronto. They're all generally on the subway line. I wanted to point out that even though it's designed for youth by youth, it is also for families. So you as a parent can go and access virtual walk-in counseling too, as long as you have a youth in your life. And you can um, access services also on a walk-in basis. And right now it is virtually by phone, unfortunately, because of COVID. Next slide. These are some of the other resources that I thought I would point out to you. So family navigation, youth wellness hubs, but also Mood Disorders Association of Ontario um, have great resources and um, support groups for families who are struggling with a bipolar uh, disorder or a depression, and also a great resource library. And eMental Health is a resource that's online, that's national. So you go on and you enter your postal code and you tell them you enter what services you're looking for, and uh, you'll be able to. Um, uh, find all the services that's within a particular kilometer um, of uh, your uh, location. Um, for family navigation, um, the program is for um, 19 and under. And for the Youth Wellness Hubs Ontario, it ranges anywhere from uh, 22 uh, down to 12 and sometimes down to um, zero. So depending on the hub that you're attending. Um, thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Chung. Um, I know you'll be sticking around to field some of those questions that you didn't get to during your talk, but uh, thank you for uh, answering some of those uh, in the flow of your talk as well, uh, and sharing some of the key signs to look out for and some very um, realistic uh, and doable um, ways of, of supporting our, our young people, uh, especially around the conversations and having those non-judgmental conversations um, and really looking at our own um, practice around well-being ourselves as parents and caregivers and guardians. So thank you. Next, um, as you're all aware, racism is a top of mind for all of us in Canada, North America in general, if not the entire world. Um, Anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism is not new, it's not gone away. Uh, and as we all kind of look, look uh, inwards to reflect on what our role and what the role we, we have uh, in playing in getting rid of systemic forms of oppression and racism, uh, we must consider the toll that it takes on our own mental health and well-being. Um, as racialized people, as allies, as parents, guardians, and caregivers, students, uh, and those supporting students and their families. Um, in that vein, uh, I'm pleased to introduce Charmaine Lane, who's, who will be speaking tonight about the effects of racial trauma on children and youth. Charmaine specializes in racialized trauma and his contribution to other mental health problems such as depression, anxi anxiety, and mental illness rooted in internalized oppression and trauma. She is experienced in child and adult mental health and spent four years as a clinical supervisor in children's mental health, focusing on dual diagnoses. She has over six years of experience counseling in the LGBTQ S2 plus community, primarily because of trauma from discrimination. Charmaine holds a master's of science in counseling psychology with a specialization in marriage and family. Thank you for being with us this evening and I'll turn it over to you, Charmaine. All right, thank you so much, Salim. Um, so, Thank you for having me, of course. And um, as I was listening to everything Dr. Chung was saying, I was sitting here thinking um, that a lot of times no one thinks of the other piece that I'll be sharing about, which is the racialized trauma. And specifically tonight, I'll be speaking about trauma as it pertains to Black bodies and trauma and the Black experience, what that is like for youth and children. Because as we know, racism is not a monolithic um, situation and for a lot of a lot of times it's grouped together and we're racialized or people of color but if um, it was a monolithic experience we would not need anti-black racism and that distinction so tonight I'll be speaking specifically about how African bodies are affected by trauma and specifically racialized trauma all right so I'm going to start um, Sure. Okay. So just to define trauma in its uh, very mainstream sense, in general, trauma can be defined as a psychological emotional response to an event 
or an experience that is deeply disturbing or, or distressing. And we are trained mainstream to, to not really look at racial trauma. Racial trauma has just become a thing over the last um, you know, some researchers have gone back to, I've gone, I've seen research from about 2006 um, and platforms such as uh, the psych, um, Psychology Today or other magazines or, um, you know, articles are being written now about racialized trauma and there's still only a handful of people who are looking into racialized trauma. So as I, as I think about racialized trauma, I want to talk a little bit about intergenerational trauma, which is the transmission of historical oppression and its negative consequences across generations. And um, we see that in many communities, but for this particular piece, we're looking into the Black community. And most times we want to move away from the slavery narrative, but we cannot deal with any form of intergenerational trauma without looking back at slavery and also the fact um, why I like to distinguish between racialized trauma, speaking of all racialized bodies, and then of course trauma, how it looks in black bodies, is because of the fact that black people were the only people um, to have been slaved, enslaved on North American soil. That's really important to know. And so it's going to make the experience very different. So we know that most um, non-white bodies were colonized all over the world. We understand what it means to look at shadism. And, you know, if you go to all communities, Asian, South Asian, indigenous, uh, you know, Arabic communities, you find that people no one wants to be at the end where black lies. And so we know that colonization, that's a product of colonization. So it's important to always look at the slavery narrative as we think about the intergenerational trauma. And it's something that I'm aware that people are very uncomfortable with and want to lean away from. But as we think about trauma tonight, and I'll be getting into racialized, racial trauma, we want to look at how the children and youth might be, might have been affected over the last little bit. Um, with everything happening in the media as it pertains to vicarious trauma. So what happens with racialized trauma or racial trauma? They don't even have to be there, you know, and I'll show you a bit how it looks similar to PTSD, but that it carries even more weight or more burden for the person that it's happening to. And as Dr. Chung was, talk was talking, like I said earlier, I was thinking about all the different, you know, I think talk about depression and anxiety and how as we go in to, um, mainstream hospitals or you know places that are looking through the that racialized lens aren't being looked through that young people aren't being asked about racial trauma and all the microaggressions and everything that they might have gone through even prior to coming coming into those spaces to engage um, one of the his, uh, the researchers that i really admire is dr um mohammed el khati and he says historical trauma um, when he thinks of his historical trauma, is that history is not about the past, it's about the present. And so for me, what that means as I look at historical trauma and racial trauma is that um, everything that has happened in the past has shaped the Black experience to this day. And in order for us to eradicate or even bring into light what's going on with Black bodies and Black children and youth, we really need to look at the history of Black people. Um, what is racial trauma? So racial trauma is, is experiencing psychological symptoms such as anxiety, hypervigilance to threat, or a lack of hopelessness for future as a result of repeated exposure to racism or discrimination. Um, Dr. Turner, again, is another researcher who's one of the handful of people who are looking at this piece of the work. Um, the trauma may result in experiencing symptoms of depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, feelings of humiliation, poor concentration, or irritability and anger outbursts. And much like what is typically seen in those suffering from PTSD, so from post-traumatic stress disorder. But what he's observed is that, is that in addition to all that, behaviors that are specific to racial trauma, including a reluctance to interact with or general mistrust of white people. And so that might seem very blatant and harsh, but as we're looking, we have to remember tonight, we're looking through trauma lens. And um, so imagine if you have a child who is presenting with some of the issues that Dr. Chung have already spoken about, 
concerning depression and, and anxiety. And you brought that young person to see a white clinician or a white psychiatrist, or even another racialized psychiatrist who's not black, and not being aware that that young person might have gone through um, hearing that, you know, when I'm six years old on the playground, I don't want to play with you because your skin looks like dirt. Right, so a six-year-old being told that, but having never told anyone, and so carrying that in his body or her body or their body, all the way until um, you know symptoms presenting issues are happening at 16, and now they're brought in to see a psychiatrist. And so what we're going to be looking for, or what psychiatrists or psychologists who are mainstream thinking are going to be looking for are the things that we're taught, you know, all the signs and symptomology of depression and anxiety. And so that's what they're getting ready to treat, not realizing that there's also something lurking at the bottom and, and in real time for this young person, because you walk in that body and you're carrying that with you all the time. The racism is with you all the time. All right. So racial trauma can be triggered by many events, but among the most common triggers are continued racial harassment, and being a victim of police violence. And these are just naming a few of what are some of the things, because sometimes, like I said, it's unprovoked. I've had clients where, um, and conversations with parents who've had children in suburbs of Toronto going to school and have been told by other racialized bodies, we will not play with you because your skin looks like dirt. So again, this is not anything foreign, I'm saying, this is out of experience, right? And so, but, but among the common triggers are continued racial harassment, sorry, I said that already, being a victim of police violence or witnessing and witnessing violence. So what they might have seen on, on TV recently with George, George Floyd in the United States, um, if, they're, if some of them are old enough, some of your teenagers might have heard about Trayvon Martin and, you know, and that's just to name a few and not even thinking about cases here in Canada even witnessing violence on the news can be damaging. So symptoms and presentation of racial trauma. Race-based traumatic stress uh, trauma differs from post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's important to, for people to really understand. Because imagine then you're, uh, you're someone who's a war veteran or something, and you're going through issues of PTSD. But underneath that, you're struggling with racialized trauma that has never been addressed, have never been talked about, all the discriminatory practices against your life. So on top of your PTSD, you're having race-based trauma, but all that people are going to be seeing is the race-based trauma, is, I'm um, sorry, the PTSD. And so lots, a lot of times what's ending up, what ends up happening is this is a very silent killer or a very silent um, traumatic experience or a very silent um, disease, for lack of a better word, that people are facing and not sometimes, especially youth and children, they have no words for it. They just know that it's happening in their bodies. And so you'll see some of the same symptoms as you'd see in depression and anxiety and other things. And sometimes just a lack of wanting to engage, going to school or being around other kids. And yet they're not saying, because when we think about racism, it's a very taboo thing. And when we think about anti-Black racism, it's even more taboo. And so a lot of times young Black youth um, ends up having, having rage, right, as opposed to um, being able to give a voice to what they're feeling. And I'll talk a little bit about the voicelessness and the internal devaluation that they feel at times. So while the content, while the content of the traumatic experience may differ, the trauma responses are similar. So the frequency, the intensity, and the pervasiveness of racial stereotypes, racial biases, and racial discrimination produces um, emotional and psychological distress as a physiological physiological stress reaction, and that's really important. I'm not sure if I included it in here, but I do have slides um, when I've done other presentation where I talk about the mind-body connection to racialized trauma, and, and so hence the physiological stress that comes with it. So altogether, these racial uh, traumas occur over and over again, resulting in what is termed racial battle fatigue. And this is a piece that's really important for us to note as we think about trauma work, as we think about um, young people that we're seeing at school, as some of you families are listening who are Black or even racialized, um, some of the things that your children might not be telling you, or some of the things that adults, you yourselves, teachers, social workers who are walking around in racialized bodies and, and for this purpose, black bodies, what 
is sometimes happening with you is racial battle fatigue because you're having this um, thing happen all the time. And so the difference between this piece of trauma work versus um, mainstream trauma work is that we always um, talk about, you know, before the trauma work can happen, we have to figure out what's going on. How is the client safe, right? So that's one of our major thing. And then also too, is the client ready to work on it? See, when it comes to um, racialized trauma or racial trauma, the person going through it doesn't have time to pause for all that, whether they're safe or whether they're ready to have a conversation because it's happening in real time and it's happening all the time. And so racial battle fatigue is just that, fatigue from hearing, seeing, and experiencing incessant racism and racial discrimination. Because individuals who face discrimination experience trauma symptoms similar to war veterans who experience PTSD symptoms, the racial battle fatigue occurs. This imagery con 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 connotes the, the, the uphill, and or just, just mean the similarity, uphill battle and exhaustion that individuals and groups of people who face racial discrimination experience on a daily basis. Um, if not dealt with, racial battle fatigue can lead to serious mental health problems and se severe psychological distress. So it's really important um, for people to recognize that this is not just something that people are coming up with. And for years, like I said, it wasn't a thing. People didn't believe that people had racial trauma and that, you know, it's it's an uphill battle and it's a it's a hard thing on your body and it's 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 something that at times you can't explain and, and at times can only explain to someone who's in the same body and who might have gone through something similar. So trauma in the black experience, what does that look like in today? What could that look like for some of the youth that um, are in this TDSB? Some of the, the young children actually in elementary, it starts as early as that. Last week I had the opportunity of presenting um, to one of the children's aid around and one worker spoke of a ch young black person that they have, um, that they're working with at the moment who attempted, actually didn't attempt, but actually poured bleach all over her arm because she wanted to get rid of the blackness and what that came with. And so think about um, how traumatic that is. And I believe she was about 10 years old. So, it, you know, and I've worked with young people who are as young as six years old who said to me, I'm not black. And when I said, okay, so what, what does it mean to be black? They'll then say to me, you know, all the criminalization that you see, all the stereotypes that you see of black people. And so if a six year old can say, I want nothing to do with this race, because this is what it looks like. Imagine the trauma that that's happening in his, and he's a he for, for this purpose. And in his body, when he realizes this is the body I'm in and will not ever be able to get out of it. He doesn't have any other way to identify. And we might say, but he doesn't have to identify as black. If we want to be realistic, he's going to walk the world as a black person because that's what he is. And so it's important for people to understand that this is a real trauma that's happening for racialized people and for black people. So trauma that is experienced through anti-black racism is present in most interactions with black people. So being followed in stores and, you know, the running joke is shopping while black. Cashiers asking for extra identification, insensitive remarks by coworkers and friends, profiling by law enforcement, driving while black, being feared and avoided, racial slurs, threats, acts of microaggressions can present um, anxiety in black people and extreme distress in black youth. As I think about um, the microaggressions and and just um, racial slurs and threats. I think about something that I always, a story I heard and I kind of use it in a lot of my um, presentations is the idea of a young person waking up, a young black boy waking up every morning, getting dressed for school. Um, parents are already gone and if not single mother is already gone and he leaves the house, runs to the elevator only to meet someone who is clutching their purse because he's heading in the elevator. He doesn't say anything, but he gets downstairs and he's walking towards the bus. The bus driver sees him, could have stopped, but leaves because his pants was too saggy and it took him a long time to run. Um, he gets to school, gets into class, is late, 
and before long, he's on de uh, detention. And so the cycle begins in that the trauma that he's experienced, just walking in that body, um, having the woman clutching her purse, um, feeling that the bus left him because he was a black boy, um, you know, and just going to class and never being asked about the racism or the microaggressions that he might have experienced on his way to school. Race related trauma wounds. So racial oppression is a traumatic form of interpersonal violence, which can lacerate the spirit, scar the soul and puncture the psyche. I love Dr. Hardy because he's one of the people that's been doing a lot of research in this area. And he does it in a broader sense. So not only concerning, even though he's a black body uh, PhD, he does it as it pertains to racialized youth. Um, you know, so, but in this case, we're looking at, you know, anti-Black racism and how, how racial trauma pertains to Black youth. So as we think about the word lacerate, it means to cut, right? To cut, sever, scar the soul and puncture the psyche, the mind, the spirit, the body, right? Without a clear and descriptive language to describe this experience, those who suffer cannot coherently convey their pain. And this is really important for people to recognize. It's hard when people are facing racial trauma to be able to say exactly what it is they're going through. They don't have the language for it. Um, and so to convey their pain, let alone heal, because we know for trauma to heal, if you're carrying it and carrying it, it never gets any, it never gets let out, then it's going to be hard for the healing to happen because we need to find a way to externalize the trauma. So the source of their hurt is often confused with distracting secondary symptoms, which is kind of what I was saying earlier. As you think about all the other um, mainstream things that we think about mental health, and not that I'm saying mental health is not in the Black experience, it is, but what I am trying to convey is that not only do we have young people who are having anxiety and depression looking through just mainstream lens, but we also are having another subdivision of them having to deal with the racialized piece that comes with that. And that's a heavy burden to carry. So you're carrying, you're, you know, you're going through, um, you know, anxiety and depression, um, eating disorders, other, other forms of mental health issues or mental illness, even something as like schizophrenia, right? Which is a, me a mental illness, but still having to carry the racial piece. And when I say that trauma comes in real time is that it doesn't matter what else is going on in your life, you're still carrying the racial trauma with you, right? And so it has to be dealt with in real time. It can't be left. Um, for when the person is safe, because what does safety look like as it pertains to racial trauma, right? And so if you leave it to say, okay, when the youth is ready to speak about it, we have to create a space for race, which hasn't been happening. And I'll talk a bit about that as I go along. So the source of their hurt is often confused with distracting secondary symptoms, ranging from hopelessness to acting out behaviors. And I highlighted the acting out behaviors in red because we know that there is such a, a criminalization of the black body. There is such a, we know black boys are suspended uh, way more than any other body in schools. You know, research is out there for that. I have that in other slides, not in this one. We know that black girls are labeled and sexualized in schools way more than everybody else. A young black girl could be wearing the same spaghetti strap versus someone else and would be deemed as not dressing appropriate because no one is thinking about um, the differences in body types and all that, right? But that's for another um, another workshop. But, you know, it's really important for us to think when we think about black kids acting out, what else is happening? Have we ever stopped to talk with them about what might be going on as far as their race? What, what oppressive situation have they encountered even prior to coming to school? And I say that because even as a, a professional, there are days when I walk into the workplace and have just had things happen to me um, because of race, and I still have to buckle down and do my job. For young people, it might be more difficult, right? Because sometimes their, their brains aren't even developed completely in order to compartmentalize some of this. And so we might see it in acting out behaviors, but if no one's looking to think it has, it may have something to do with their race, then no one's gonna see it. 
So racial oppression is seldom seen as contributing to these difficulties in discussion of race are either dismissed or manufacturing as manufactured as excuses, right? So we're thinking that, um, oh, they're, this, they're just making an excuse, right? Without really thinking about how race can play a, a, a part in these young people's mental health. And also to another big piece is that we, um, you know, mo for the most part, unless you're looking for it, some of it is just um, looked at as a justification for bad behavior. We ask the wrong questions as with other forms of trauma. What is wrong with them, right? And we do that in trauma work. People do that. What is wrong with them? So unless you know better, you, you wouldn't be saying what has happened to them or what is happening to you if you're asking it directly. All right, so healing the hidden wounds of racial trauma. So three things that happens, um, according to Hardy, is that what's called internalized evaluation, assaulted sense of self, and internalized vo voicelessness. So this is happening in a racialized body and in a black body as they're going through. So with these young people, they're going through what's called internalized evaluation, and, and it, it causes an assault on self and internalized voicelessness. Um, internalized evaluation is, is where they begin to feel completely devalued and, and really look at mainstream and the norm. So almost as white, whiteness is looked at as a deity, right? And so when you're not able to measure up to that, and then, and, and so I want to paint the picture for you. It's white, everyone else in the middle, and then there's black. And so if we think about even the, the model minority myth, you know, where it's structured to uphold white supremacy and to have people in the middle also kind of white chase. And I know my words are strong, but I really need for people to understand, you know, and so it's a white chase white chasing happening here and then black bodies are left here and so when the black young person is left here and all that he sees about himself are the criminalization the bad stereotypes the angry black mother that's going to come into the school and so he's learned to devalue himself right and so he continues to assault himself right to say i'm not worth anything because he can never measure up to where everybody else is at and so the middle the people in the middle also unless they're woke to what's happening then the how the structure is and i'm trying to envision it in school the white body is then saying look at all the people in the in the middle they're the model and you cannot even measure up to that and so the trauma just keeps going like this and then the internalized voicelessness is where they're finding that they, they don't have the words to say what they're going through, right? And to give a voice to it or a language. And so it just becomes um, something that's happening internally and going nowhere else. So I just wanted to share this case um, to kind of bring the point home and then I'll give you the strategies as to how we can help to heal some of these wounds. So a case of racial trauma. Latanya is a 17 year old girl who's recently become withdrawn, sad and delusional as reported by her parents. She was taken to see a black female therapist who specializes in racial trauma. The therapist in her first visit knowing the background of this youth that she had been living in a predominantly white space for the past 12 years, recognized that there might be issues of racial trauma. The therapist was direct in her questioning. Can you tell me a story of a time when you felt proud of being black, when you felt proud of being black in school? The youth responded, never. Therapist, why not? Youth, because I was, I, I'm sorry, because I was six years old and was called N-word. Then another time I was asked, what tribe are you from? What is there to be proud of? The therapist, after further questioning, realizes that this youth had never told the story to anyone prior to, now, prior to now. No one had ever asked her about racial oppression. All right, so as we think about that scenario and just, for the, just to let you know it's actual real scenario, not the name or anything, but it's a real case. So as we think about this, what uh, Dr. Hardy is saying in his research is that when, when this is happening, one of the things that we wanna do is affirmation and acknowledgement. 
So begin to help these young people to heal. So it's important for the helping professional to convey a general understanding, or even parents in this case, right? And acceptance of the premise that race is a critical organizing principle in society. Not that it's the truth about who the young person is, but that it is an organizing principle. So you're not saying to the young person, are you sure this happened or, you know, um, oh no, we're all the same. Because the minute we begin to say we're all the same, we've rendered now that young person in front of us invisible. And so it's important for, the, for again, for us to be able to affirm and acknowledge that yes, and even if you're not a black body or racialized body sitting in front of that young person, you do want to acknowledge that yes, race is an organizing principle in society and sort of help the young person to find how do they fit into that. And then second, we want to create a space for race, right? So the minute you begin to acknowledge and affirm, you're then creating a space for race. And by creating a space for race, we're conveying a sense of openness and curiosity. So I want to ask the young person to tell us more about what's happening. We take a very proactive role in encouraging conversations about race, right? And this can be done through what's called racial storytelling. So young people are invited to share personal stories of racial experiences. So if you look at the, um, the scenario I gave earlier, this was a form of racial storytelling. It was me saying, well, in this case, it was asking the young person, you know, something, you know, when was the first, have you ever felt uh, good about being Black while you're at school? Understanding that she is in a, in a predominantly white space where at times she is probably the only black young person in most of her grade. And so it's important to understand what does that look like for her. So this, like I said, um, young people are invited to share personal stories of racial, racial experience. This enables them to develop their voice and begin to think critically about their experience growing up as a youth of color or a black youth. So when you know, if we were thinking of youth of color, tell me something that you like about being Asian, right? And tell me something you're proud of. When was the first time you realized that you were, you were South Asian, you were Sri Lankan, you were Indian? When was the first time you realized that? And so the young person will then be able to convey and let you know what, they, what their thoughts is on race. And then from there, we could understand what's happening with them and if they've been impacted by racial trauma. The other piece is validation. Young people are invited to share personal stories of racial experiences. This enables them to develop their voice and begin to think critically about their experience growing up. And I think I probably put the same thing twice, so I do apologize for that. But basically validation is now, it's similar to affirmation and acknowledgement. So basically what you're actually doing is instead of just affirming and acknowledging what's happening now is we're validating it for them and making it really personal and helping them to change the narrative of thinking that, um, you know, what they're feeling is just something isolated to them. So the process of naming. One of the most debilitating aspects of racial oppression is that this is a nameless condition. And I think I've said that earlier. It's something that once, you're, once it's happening to you, you're not even sure what to call it. And for most of the young people that I've had in session and adults who've had severe racial oppression and have had racial trauma, and I've had them in, in counseling in, in my private practice, is people are just like, oh, wow. You know, I, I had a girl who came in, big high profile Bay Street job, and was struggling with racial trauma because at work people made jokes right in front of her. There were a lot of microaggressions that just, you know, seemed as though it was nothing. I've had um, people come in who said, you know, I was the only black person in the space and they used the N word and said, well, it's in rap music and all that. Why can't we use it? And so just having a lot of, um, a lot of no one to even side with you in the space. And so it often makes me think about younger children and what it feels like. I know the story I shared earlier about a six-year-old who was told that his skin looked like dirt. You know, he told his parents and parents just said, you know, you've got to stick it out you know, and do the work because at the end of the day, you know, black people, we're taught to be resilient, right? And so if racial trauma is happening, it might be nameless for them. They just know that what you said and did didn't feel right. And even though it doesn't feel right, I dare not say it's racism because half the time 
I'm not believed. So, um, like I said, it's a nameless condition, difficult to describe, quantify, or codify, which means it's hard to encode it, right? To decode it, rather, um, and to, to describe it even. All right, the next one is externalized devaluation. So we talked at the top about internalized devaluation. So now we, it's the goal of the helping professional or whoever to help the person to externalize the devaluation. This is a direct way to heal the wounds of internalized devaluation. We help youth understand why respect and the absence of respect are so important. And so this is looking through a space where you're saying your body, your mind, your spirit, who you are is worth respecting regardless of, of your race. Your race is not um, what should define you, right? And we really begin to help the youth understand that um, this, what you're feeling should not be something that you're owning. Because remember, we're always thinking about trauma, right? And so the goal is to externalize the trauma. And then uh, second to last, we have counteracting the devaluation. Hey, Charmaine, it's Salim. Are you, do we still have you? I think we may have lost Charmaine. It's still her screen. Her screen is still being shared. Is, any, is anyone else catching Charmaine or am I the only one who can't uh, hear her at the moment? No, she's out and her screen stopped sharing as well. So may I propose at this time we just do a stretch break, Salim, and then resume with... Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Hopefully uh, she's uh, just, yeah, we'll just take a two to three minute break. Um, just to stretch, move around, get something to drink if you need to, uh, and we'll be right back in, in it in about uh, three minutes. Thank you. It might seem crazy what I'm about to say. Sunshine, she's here, you can take a break. Baby, by the way, huh? Because I'm happy. Love
right, welcome back everyone. Hope everyone got a chance to just stretch out a little bit. So it's, unfortunately we lost uh, Charmaine there. She's having a few challenges with her internet, but um, uh, I just wanted to thank her for her time and input specifically on the topic of racialized uh, young people and trauma. I think um, the one statement that she had that, that really stuck with me was creating a space for race. Um, and I think that's an important thing to remember, not just now, but as we move forward. Um, and, and I think this is a good, um, I guess, time to remember that uh, this Friday, uh, the third section of, of this um, series is taking place um, at the same time, 6.30 on Friday, uh, the title being Talking Race with Children and Youth. So um, please tune in on Friday, 6.30, if we continue that conversation. Um, Next, we want to switch gears a little bit um, and look at social media, newer technology, and the intersection of mental health and well-being with teens uh, with Scott St. Marie. So Scott St. Marie, welcome. Um, his mission is to help people take control of their mental health. His presentations demystify mental health. I just lost my screen there. Um, you just demystified my screen. Oh, there we go. Demystify mental health and reveal the connection between social media use and feelings of stress, anxiety, and depression. Understanding our fundamental psychological need is the first step towards making this conversation truly mainstream. People can find Scott on iTunes and YouTube where he continues to reach 30,000 unique humans every single day. Uh, I'll also add that Scott is a partner with us here at the TDSB and has facilitated many engaging sessions with students and staff that um, are very well received. So thank you for that as well. Over to you, Scott. Thanks, Aleem. Thank you, everyone. Um, good to be here. So uh, I know we're running a bit late. This won't take uh, too long because I know there are some great questions in the chat as well we'd love to get to, and I'd love to get to them too and help out any way I can. Um, you know, let's just start with this, everyone. Let's just start with those basic psychological needs and get into screens and how they're really affecting our mental health and social media. The basic psychological needs, as we know, is kids and parents, all humans alike, have a need to belong. We have a need and craving to be understood. And we have a need to be loved. Let's, let's keep it there and keep it simple. So when we're seeing our children on their phones, I have mine right here, you know, you don't go too far without it. When we see our kids on our phones, it's that need for connection. It's the need to be understood. It's the need to be loved. It's the need to feel like you matter in this world. That's where it comes from. So yes, my videos and my podcast, it reaches about 40,000 people every day, mostly teenagers, okay? 40,000 people. So I get quite a few emails that come in every day. And I'd like to share what most adolescents and teens share with me in those emails. Because I usually ask them, why are you reaching out to a stranger? You have parents? And they say, yeah, Scott, and I bet you're all going to repeat after me here. You might know what they're going to say. Scott, they just don't understand. Scott, they just don't understand. They don't get it. They don't get how I'm feeling. They don't understand what it's like to be a teenager. So there's a missing dialogue that we're having between two different generations because it is so different now with TikTok, YouTube, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, and who else knows what's next. This technology is, is ruling our lives and it is part of our routine right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Social media is a tool and we need to use it to the best of our ability. But this is kind of what I need to really address here is how it's affecting our mental health. So I'd like to share my screen here. Every parent should know a few things about what your kids are doing online and, and how this whole thing works. Because I've worked at Twitter and Facebook and as a YouTuber and content creator, I'd like to show you a bit of behind the scenes. So Every parent should know what this is. This is called a Facebook pixel. Now, a lot of your kids are on YouTube, a lot of them on Instagram, a lot of them on TikTok as well. A lot of them are playing video games, uh, Fortnite, Apex Legends, um, uh, Battlegrounds. You may know a Minecraft. These, these names might resonate with you. But on, on their phones and on the computer, they're being tracked. Okay? Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Facebook owns Twitter. I mean, Facebook owns Instagram. They know what your children are doing online, which means one thing that every website they go to, and it was my job to put this piece of code. This is just a little piece of code that you put on websites. And this piece of code tells us what your children are doing online, what your children are doing and watching on YouTube, 
on TikTok, what websites they're going to, what they're interested in, how long they're on their phone for, how long they swipe for, what do they click, right? When they go to bed, when they wake up, when they turn off their phone, when they turn on their phone, this piece of code tracks everything. So we ask why our kids love their phone so much. Why do they, why, when they wake up, 74% of Gen Z and millennials, the first thing they do when they wake up is pick up their phone. The first thing they do, 75% use it in the bathroom as well. I know we're all guilty of that one. So this pixel is tracking everything that we do online, which means when our kids go to YouTube, when they go on social media, their feeds, you know, when you scroll through, their feeds are beautifully tailored. The YouTube algorithm knows exactly what they want to watch before we do. That's how smart the technology is because it knows, okay, you went to this cooking website, you got a recipe about potatoes, and then you went on this website, then you went to the news. So we're going to tailor your YouTube feed, your Twitter feed, Instagram feed, TikTok feed to what you're looking at on the rest of the internet. So we wonder why it's addicting. We wonder why when you watch one video, you can't wait to watch the next because YouTube knows exactly what you're interested in next. They know exactly that. Now, what you can show, see, it's one thing to have this dialogue with your children. The next thing is to show them, right? So I want you all to be one step ahead of them in this regard. So one thing you can do to show them about this online tracking is to show them that Facebook pixel. The next thing we can do, whether you're an Apple user or an Android user, is do what's called Google Takeout. And Google Takeout looks something like this. Uh, da, da, da. Looks something like this. All you have to do, I can plug this into the chat, is go to this website here. Okay, it's a little different for Apple, but I'll share that one as well. And what it's going to do, if you go to this website, what Google and Apple will give you is every single thing you've ever searched since you got your device. Everything. And you can show your children that. It's about having this dialogue of openness. Hey, guess what? Apple knows this about you, this about you, this about you. Every single video you watched, every website you went to, my friends, it's all here. And it dumps them and then it emails you all of these files. So it's interesting because a lot of kids know how to clear the history in their browser if they're going to inappropriate websites. We need to know that 60% of 12-year-olds in the U.S. have already watched pornography. This is serious. So we need to know, even though they're clearing the history, we need to know what our kids are doing on their devices. Because this is another relationship. It's a relationship with technology. It's a whole other world that they're experiencing. So we need to be ahead of them. So this is called Google Takeout, and it's for Apple as well, and it's totally free. You have the rights to your information, and you can have it all back. That's one thing to share with your kids. So it's about being a step ahead of them, but I want to share also why technology is is actually causing anxiety and stress and depression. Sorry, let me just open up this blind here. In our kids, there you can see me a little better. We need to know that both our psychology and physiology are completely connected. So the brain is the mind, right? The mind is the body, sorry. The body is the mind. So I need to introduce a very, very special human being. And this, this is something every human being should know. And every single person on earth should know this gentleman here. JC, John Cacioppo, he's a show, social neuroscientist. And he wanted to really discover what loneliness did to people. So when you feel lonely, this is what's happening with a lot of kids. When you feel lonely with COVID, right? Anxiety, depression, feeling these intense emotions, when we feel lonely, why do we feel more anxious? So John Cacioppo did an experiment, right? Okay, so he, he get a, got a bunch of people, parents, kids, teens, and he said, go about your day. I'm just going to measure a few things throughout the day. Okay, so he gave them all a tube, a little plastic tube to spit in. I'll get to that. He gave them a beeper, a heart rate monitor, and some probes to put on them throughout the day. This was the coolest experiment I've ever heard of. Okay, so all the kids go to the playground, all the parents go to work, and John Cacioppo says, okay, throughout the day, when you feel lonely, 
just, just write it down. What time of day, where you were, how you felt. He didn't define loneliness for them. Okay. So they did that. And he said, when I give you that beep, because that's why I gave you the beeper. When the beeper goes off on your belt, right? You need to spit in that tube as well. People are like, okay, what's the big deal? Well, what happens is when people reported feeling lonely, kids, adults, parents, the reason they spit in that tube was so John Cacioppo could measure their cortisol levels, their stress hormone. So when people feel lonely, their stress shoots through the roof. The reason he gave them all those probes is kids alike and adults, their blood pressure shoots through the roof. It's like they were being physically attacked. He got the heart rate monitor on them. Heart rate shoots through the roof. So when we feel lonely, when kids feel lonely, it has a direct impact on how they feel physiologically, the nervous energy. And then what happens with technology is that we have this nervous, nervous energy, we feel lonely, and we crave that connection. And we look to our phones. So we can't be surprised when our children who are feeling lonely look to their phones for that connection. So how do we mitigate this? How do we mitigate the feelings of depression and anxiety? And I could show you graph after graph, and we could get really boring about the links between social media and anxiety, but I'll just show you one that, that you'll, you'll really find interesting about loneliness. So in 2007, my friends, the iPhone came out. What, a, what an interesting time that was because Steve Jobs came out on stage and he showed everyone, look at what the new iPhone can do. And it was the first touchscreen iPhone. The crowd went nuts, right? An amazing piece of technology. And ever since then, kids reported feeling lonelier than ever, even though they had a device. Even though we're so connected with the world, and this is a survey of 1.1 million children out of the U.S., out of the educational surveillance, um, surveillance uh, surveys. And this is uh, done by Jean Twenge. If you don't know about her, I'll share a resource uh, on my last slide. The iPhone, the connection, the, the technology that we have to connect each other isn't helping us feel better. Because we need to look at what loneliness can also mean. Loneliness, and this is, this is about where we have that dialogue between parent and son or daughter. Loneliness is not just the absence of people that we've been experiencing during COVID. It's the feeling that what you do and share doesn't matter to anyone. And can we, do we have a bell? Where's the ding, ding, ding? Can anyone relate to this definition? Because this is why people go into an office. Kids might go to school and they'll still report feeling lonely, even though they're surrounded by coworkers and friends and teachers and people alike. It's because what people do and share, they feel doesn't matter. So our kids go, in, go on our phones, they go on their phones and they, they scream to the world, look at me, notice me, say hi to me, see what I'm doing. And we remember when our kids were younger, they'd be up on the slide and they're like, mom, dad, watch. I'm about to go down. Wait, you're not watching. Please watch. I'm about to go down the slide. That's why they're on social media. That's why they play games with friends online. They're looking for their voice. It's very simple. And the great news is that parents can allow them to have that voice in the home and build that trust. So loneliness isn't just the absence of people, but we use social media and we use technology to still feel loved, to still look for that understanding, right? And to still belong. That's what, we, that's what we're I do these presentations with a friend of mine, uh, Kirsten Siggins, and they're usually about an hour long, but we go over command and control parenting and curious and thinking partner parenting because I'm not going to be able to parent like my parents parented me. It's a different time with technology and the world is much bigger for children. So right now with technology, if our kids are, are playing video games for a long time, I saw a comment. My son or daughter can't stop playing video games. They're on there all the time. Well, the initial response would be stop playing video games. Get off there. You have an hour to play. When I say get off, get off. Now, if we move from looking for obedience in our children to actually asking them 
to be critical thinkers, to challenge them to be critical thinkers. Because how many of us have actually tried playing the video game with our children? How many of us have asked about the video game? Asking what rank they are in Fortnite, ask them what they've built in Minecraft, have actually picked up the controller and tried to play and take interest and be active and present. So there's a difference between being the curious parent and being the command and control. And of course, during this stressful time, it's very easy and convenient to say, just don't do this. And we have to be gentle with ourselves to say, sometimes, you know, after a long day, I just have to put, make, you know, some, set some ground rules. But when we have a little more energy to have a curious and open mindset to think, well, well, maybe why do they look at their phone the first thing in the morning? Why are they bringing their phone to the, to the table when they eat? Why do they play video games for two hours and not blink? And what's happening with screen time is actually in the UK, uh, the more screen time, actually glasses and prescriptions have gone up 50% in the last six years because when we look at our screens, we blink half as much. So children are actually having damaged retinas. That's a whole other talk. But if we can develop this state of curiosity with how our kids are using technology, I think that will do, do just wonders in how we actually that open up that conversation about mental health. So just as our previous presenter said, it's about how you show up to your kids. It's about how you set the example. So if, if you're going to ask them how their mental health is doing, a lot of us, me included, will have our phone if we're having a discussion with our children or someone. And what we'll do is we'll put it right next to us on the table and say, I'm all ears, right? You can, you can trust me, I'm listening. Well, the signal that we're sending to our children who we're speaking with is that they're only getting 80% of our attention because our phone is right in front of us. And if it goes off, we're gonna look. To be completely present and actively listen, we need to put our phones away. So I know I'm running out of time, but the last thing I just wanna share with you, the last slide, is just two questions to really leave with today. Just two questions. And that is, how are you creating opportunities of real connection for your children? Now, when I say connection, I, I, and I mean that, that other antidote to loneliness, to making sure that they know that they matter and that someone truly cares about them being understood and belonging. So what opportunities are you creating? Is it a movie night? Is it a family dinner where there's no cell phones at the table? Is it buying the latest board game? Because board games are actually coming back. What do you meme? There's apples to apples. There's taboo. There's all, there's tons of uh, video game um, board games as well. So you can have that in-person conversation. And the second question is, am I doing what I'm doing? Is that a reflection of what I want to see in my child's present and future? So if you come home and you're on your phone, if you're cooking dinner and you're on your phone, if you're trying to speak to someone and you put your phone next to you on the table, what, are, what message are you sending your children? Because children don't actually listen as well as we think. They watch what we do, and that's how they learn, not what we say. So set the example with what we're doing with our technology, and it would go a long way. And this is what, since, since I coach teenagers who reach out to me, and we have these discussions, and it's amazing if you listen to a teenager and you literally have absolutely no judgment, because that's what they're looking for. And you ask them, okay, how are things going? So you use your phone a lot. What, what are you using? What apps are you using? Oh, you saw that on TikTok? Okay, well, why do you think that was funny? Okay, have you seen this? What do you think of this instead? Hey, have you tried actually dimming the brightness before bed and turning on night mode? Have you seen how that changes sleep? Oh, what would happen if, okay, let's try when you get up out of bed, you wait 10 minutes before you look at your phone. And then let's write down how you feel instead. Okay, let's try something here. After you're scrolling through Instagram, before you scroll through, actually, let's write down how you feel out of 10, six out of 10. Okay. Let's see after you scroll through Instagram, let's look at the pre and post scroll check. So after you scroll through, let's rate how you feel now. You know what a lot of times happens? They feel an eight out of 10. And after 15 minutes of scrolling through their phones, they feel a seven out of 10. They feel a four out of 10. So we need to give proof to our kids on how these things work. We can't just tell them cell phones are bad. 
right? Technology is bad. Games are bad. They can discover these things for themselves. And that's what happens with an open mindset. So um, that's, re that's really it for me. It's about having that open mindset and, and, and creating that connection that kids feel understood and they feel loved and they feel like they belong. That's what the technology is for. That's what it's been intended for. And it's not working. It's not working. So you can actually fill that as a parent right now. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much, Scott, for uh, those very practical pieces. I know pretty much any anyone who probably has a device in front of them right now has a tab open with Google Takeout on it, at least if not for looking through now at some time later. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I really appreciated the analogy of uh, watching a, a child go down the slide, mom and dad, look at me kind of situation. Um, that really uh, analogy really brought it home for me. Um, I know we've gone over time. Uh, we've had a lot of great um, uh, input from our three esteemed presenters. Um, but we wanted to uh, take a few more minutes just to go over the most popular questions that we've had around uh, routines uh, for teens specifically. So um, Scott, Amy, or Charmaine, uh, do you have any thoughts uh, in regards to um, not just the situation that we find ourselves in right now with distance learning, um, but potentially the return to school and not knowing what that may look like, um, what we can do to kind of help best support our, our teens um, with their routine so that whenever they return to whatever they return to, um, they're in a better place, hopefully, to, to deal with whatever comes their way. And that's for any of our three esteemed panelists. Um, I, I can start. I, I think, you know, we're all kind of out of sorts right now. Routine is out the window for even adults right now. And I think we need to give ourselves some slack, cut ourselves some slack and know that our kids are under some significant stress right now too. It's, it's been a challenging time for everyone. And um, I think having some, I've been answering the questions on the chat that just having some basic limits on scheduling is really important. Kind of a, a limit on bedtime, wake up time, when you eat meals and some limits around kind of doing social things, active things. I think having some general, uh, you know, kind of uh, boundaries around that is going to be really helpful for your teenagers. Be trying to be really structured right now when you don't have a structured life, I think is going to be very difficult for your child and for you to follow through on it anyways. Scott or Charmaine, do you have anything you'd like to add? I was going to say, I agree with Dr. Chung as far as parents basically have to be the ones to set the example. And I, I'm finding that with my own self. There are times when I do feel, um, you talk about the, the being on the plane and you needing to make sure um, that the mask goes on yourself first. And I've been doing a lot of, you know, work and a lot of Zoom and all this other stuff. And I'm finding that um, unless I'm practicing self-care, they're not practicing self-care. You know, they're looking to me to ensure that every single thing they do is based on what I'm doing, if that makes sense. You know, it's almost like, you, you know, what Scott said earlier about you, saying, okay, you have my undivided attention, but the cell phone is right there, right? So everything, um, and, and one other piece that I always say to people, whatever was sustaining your family prior to COVID is the thing that you should still go to to sustain. So if you walk the dog, then continue walking the dog, not picking up yoga or another suggestion just because it's suggested, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you um, did family movies, still do family movies. So whatever, because the, the thing that all of us need to realize is that not only are we out of sorts, but we're also um, in crisis mode, right? And when you're in crisis mode, everything you do is gonna look different than what you did when you were thriving and, you know, when you weren't surviving, when you were thriving and not surviving, right? So we're in survival mode right now. So it looks very different than what it would look like. And I, I've conveyed that I have a seven and a three-year-old and I've conveyed it not to say survival mode, but just explaining to them why things look differently and why the routines look differently. But nonetheless, we still need to have some type of a routine because I've learned the hard way that children actually um, really, really um, want to be parented. And we know that being in children's mental health, I, I learned that very quickly that children want you to parent them. So even if we're having a hard time now staying focused, they still need us to give them some level of guidance. 
So it's important for parents to model what that looks like and maybe find, you know, kind of tweak it and figure it out for this period that we're in. So, yeah. Absolutely. It seems to be a bit of a running theme for uh, all the presentations tonight, the, the modeling piece of things for sure. Scott, do you have anything you want to add? Um, no, I, I think the modeling is, is definitely a, a massive piece. I'll just share one extra thing because it, it's I, what I share with parents is, uh, and their kids is uh, cell phone contracts, right? Because a lot of us, a lot of the parents here are paying for their kids' phones, right? So it's not necessarily a right. It's still a privilege to have a phone. We need to realize that it's amazing piece of technology. So if we're going through this phone contract um, and, and parents can edit it any way they like, this is another way that, okay, here's an example. I will hand my phone into my parents promptly at, you know, let's say 8 PM every school night and then weekend at 10 PM. And what has to happen with, let's say a cell phone contract or what we agree on is the parents need to follow that exactly as well. If the child comes down the stairs at, at midnight for a drink and the parents are up on their phones, it's not going to look great. So we need to be exactly in sync and set that example. And obviously it's easier said than done. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> we need to say all that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Thank you so much for, for sharing your opinions uh, and, and your wealth of expertise, uh, Dr. Amy, Scott, and Charmaine, thank you for sharing your expertise and time being on our panel and sharing with us tonight. Apologies for going over time to all of those who have tuned in. Uh, I wanted to thank all of those who made this evening possible. Piak, Michelle Monroe, and the staff team, Trustee Sherno Slynn, uh, and everyone for putting this night together. Uh, I'd encourage everyone to also join in uh, with us on Friday evening, 6.30, uh, this Friday evening, 6.30 as well, uh, with the session, Talking Race with Children and Youth. Uh, I want to thank you all again for joining in. And big thanks again to our three esteemed panelists for joining us and sharing their time and expertise. And I want to wish everyone an enjoyable rest of the evening. Be well. Thank you. Thank you.